House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren, Mr. Eric Shapiro, or the doctor as we call him, is here. Al, how are you? I'm I'm delicious. Oh, excellent. I missed you. I, I always miss you when you're not around. Well, you know, I miss me too when I'm not around. <laughs> yeah. Thing is, you know, I just disappear. Yeah, yeah. Don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah, I'm no longer there. I'm just not. Right. Well, uh, that's that's a pretty depressing update. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's all about the the holidays. The holidays passed by. I didn't even realize I was so so kind of caught up in things here. But yeah. So what do you do for New Year's? You stay up? Do you do you watch that? Uh, any of those late shows and the balls dropping? You know, it kind of brings me down. I don't really like it that much. I uh, um, I actually the past couple years, just for my kids' sake, because they're just old enough where they can stay up and see it. I've watched it with them, but I like. I kind of can't stand New Year's in general. I don't mean to be um, a downer about it, but uh, I think all the hype about New Beginnings, like, like it's like the moment where people that never get anything accomplished speak the loudest about how great it's going to be. And I think, pe- I think people that are more driven are like, all right, can we just get on with a normal week already? So I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be so negative about no, it. Yeah, I, I, kind of lay, I kind of lay low. And no, I'm the down. same way. I agree. I, I, just, I run yeah. through the programs from NBC like they show. You get all the segments. And I look through to see what everyone was doing on New Year's. And I don't stay up. I don't waste my time. You know, when I want to do something, yeah, I just yeah, do it. It doesn't uh, have to be January 1st for me to do it, you know. That's exactly it. Yeah, and I um, I remember my grandparents used to say, "Oh, it's just another another day," and I thought that was so sad that they had that attitude. But I've I've sort of gotten there on my own. It's like, yeah, it's just I mean, come on, it's the calendar, yeah. and uh, that's I mean, I might go into a different phase where it excites me again someday. But at the moment, I'm like, yeah, let's just get this. You know, and I think I'm getting old. I think I'm a stranger in a new world because you know I'm watching through and I was yeah. watching the CNN leaks, and it was like you know Andy Cohen and Anderson Cooper, and of course. They're, you know, sure, they're yeah. And, you know, in, while everyone's celebrating and they're doing just before the countdown, they're talking about people that got killed and hanging in Iran and all these sort of things going on. I'm thinking, oh, my God, right. It's kind yeah, of it's depressing like while you're, you know, 10 minutes to midnight and everyone's going to do the countdown. <laughs> right. I also, I agree. I also think COVID has sort of added like an atmosphere of like, all right, like we're all a little reluctant to look forward to the future. Like we just get to a more stable place. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's a tough thing to be out there in the streets. I guess. But, but I'm glad. Look, I'm glad it's a new year. I'm looking forward to this new year. I actually didn't have the best year last year, so I'm I'm all for it. Yeah. So you know, let's hope for yeah. something good. Well, you know, it's, so That's now we're we're going to talk about uh, horror today, right? Uh, we've got the yes. director of a new movie called Fang. Um, that's close to, I made a movie once called something like that, but it wasn't called Fang. It didn't have the N in it. So okay. <laughs> So listen, why, why would you? How could you provoke me to laugh? Like I just uh, because I, I'm gonna have problems. I'm gonna have problems for the rest of my life. Well, I'm here to disrupt yeah. things, right? Yeah, the, the uh, yeah, isn't that kind of what artists do, right? You... Yeah, that's true. Now I'm with you. I'm, I'll, yeah. I'll well, there you go, like a jock strap. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so now let's get uh, uh, Richard Hargy Bergen on. So, Richard, you've got a new movie out, and you call it Fang. That's right, Al. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm the writer and director of Fang and executive producer, casting director, and a bunch of other roles. That's what we do on low-budget movie. Everybody has, like, ten different jobs. Yeah. But writer and director is the most important but does it, does that make it harder? Do you find, like, when you're making a movie and you have so many responsibilities, um, don't you feel a lot more pressure? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah. pressure to do it. Although at the same time, you know, I think that pressure can also be inspiring. You know, because it's you know, especially when you're writing something that's horror or it's suspenseful, is that you know you want to feel that intense anxiety because that gets you plugged into what you're doing and then you can connect to the characters who are feeling intense anxiety over their lives and I think that makes it more real when you know you're feeling a lot of the same anxiety and pressure 
yourself for thankfully different reasons, but it's, you know, I think it's all interconnected. So in essence, you're making a movie to distress people because you're distressed. <laughs> no, there you go. I'm spreading <laughs> stress around. Wait, R- Richard, what was the budget on your film, if you don't mind us asking? The budget ended up being, I think, about $150,000 by the end, which is more than I originally planned on. But, you know, when, when it's like, you know, one, one thing I've learned as a filmmaker is that, you know, like what you're doing when you're planning out a budget for a movie, you got to plan for things going wrong because... On every movie that you make, something will go wrong. It's only a matter of time. There's no such thing as a completely smooth film shoot, even if you have a higher budget. So by the end, the budget of Fang ended up being about $50,000 higher than I originally planned. My original thought was I can make a $100,000 movie, so it ended up being a $150,000 movie. But, you know, I think, you know, that it could have been a lot worse it could have been you know because i've heard about movies where the budget tripled by the end of it or even more than that right so i think you have to plan for you know contingency insurance you got to plan for things not going according to plan that's i think that's a very important lesson that I, I, that I learned. Wait, so at what point did you see the budget going up? Like, when did when did you sense it creeping upward? Before we started filming, it already went up by $20,000. Oh, okay, just in the pre-production. In pre-production, it was already going up because I talked to my producer and cinematographer. They were like, we don't think this can be made for $100,000, you know? And I'm like, okay, you know, it's... It's more money than I thought, but, you know, you got to be flexible and you got to stay committed to it. Even when the movie is driving you insane, you got to stay committed to it. And what do you do? So you put together private money, I presume, to uh, make the movie. So when you ran into overages, what did you do? You went back to the investors and said, hey, look, we need more? Uh, Yeah, well, I, I took a big risk by making this and... This goes into my own, you know, personal background and what inspired the making of Fang in the first place. And, you know, in retrospect, it was not a responsible decision for me to make Fang, but I'm really glad I did. I'm really glad I took this crazy risk because, you know, and I think, you know, with all movies, it's a crazy risk that, you know, that leads to making it because... If, you know, you're doing something that's risk-free, then you're not making movies. You're working, like, at an office or something. You're doing a sensible job. But I felt like, you know, back then that I have a story to tell. And, you know, I'm willing to, you know, put my own ass on the line to tell it. I'm, I'm willing to risk money that I have in my own family to make this movie. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, yeah, the words uh, artist and responsible don't belong to the same <laughs> no. sentence. So it's like, yeah, if you're going to oh, no. do it, you're going to do it. So tell us more about the story in terms of, uh, give us a preview of what it is and why it's so personal to you. Well, Fang tells the story of a young man named Billy Cochran. He's a janitor. He lives with his mother, Gina. And they have, like, kind of a dysfunctional relationship, as many families do. And Billy has autism, so he he has a lot of issues relating to people. He is very kind of isolated and alienated. And his mother, Gina, much like my dad, is dying from Parkinson's. And so she has her own issues relating to other people because the disease is getting increasingly worse for her. It is clouding her mind. It is making it harder for her to have good judgment. And so one night, Billy wakes up. He goes to use the bathroom at home, and there's this rat in the bathtub. And so the rat jumps out. It chases Billy around the house, and it bites him. And from that point forward, Billy starts turning into a rat. He starts seeing rat fur on his skin. He starts to feel more and more rat-like. 
and he's having these rat urges. And so that's that's the most I can say without giving too much away. First of all, for the listeners, I've seen the movie and I thought it was excellent. That's oh, why I you, wanted Eric. to have you on. It's fantastic. And uh we also talked about after I watched it, and I, I think people are probably gleaning this from just listening to what you just said, it is intended to be kind of funny, right? Like it's horror, but the transformation into a rat struck me while I was watching it as intentionally absurd. It is, to some degree. I like the idea of mixing kind of like comedy and tragedy because I think, you know, people think that it's like mutually exclusive, but I think that, you know, something can be absurd and tragic or funny and horrifying at the same time. I don't think it has to be one or the other. It can be both, you know, life is funny and horrifying, at least according to me. <laughs> well, what was the atmosphere like on set? Was it lighthearted and were people having a good time or was it more of a heavy, serious atmosphere? Um, you know, it was, it was a mix of both. It was, it was a very intense film shoot. We shot it in over 23 days in January and February in Chicago. So the weather was not warm but, you know, it, it's kind of a bonding experience when you have this shared, you know, difficult experience of filming, you know, and, and I think that, you know, we had a few conflicts on set, but by the end of it, I think we felt, you know, very close by the end of the filming of Fang. I think, you know, there was definitely a lot of joking around on set, too, so I think... You know, when you have this kind of experience, you know, it could be a bonding experience or it could drive people completely far apart. It can go either way. Well, uh, how many people were in the casting crew, roughly? I think it was about, like, at any given time, probably, I think there were, like, 17 or 18 acting roles total. And then we had probably about that number of people in the crew total, too. So it wasn't a huge number of people on set at any given time, which I think helps, you know, for having more of like a tight knit, you know, feeling. Yeah. I have to ask Al, the host, the question, Al, have you ever transformed into a rat? I do it every day. Yeah. Yeah. See, <laughs> I, I figure that's part of why I wanted Richard on because he's an expert. No, well, you know that, but that leads the question of what, what does that represent to, to you, Richard? Like what is the rat itself or the transformation into that? represent to you being as it's such a uh let's say an inspirational or uh, you know something that means something to you in the, in the making of this well that is a great question al what i what i think that the rat means to me and this isn't what i originally thought when i wrote thing you know because i've i've been you know working with the story you know for several years now so what i've realized is that what the rat means to me is the rat is everything we want to deny about ourselves. The rat is the dark side. The rat is, you know, these kind of antisocial, animalistic urges that we have, you know, because, you know, we, we always want to present our best selves. You know, we want to be good people. We want to be responsible people. We want to be members of society. But then we have a different side of our personality that is not that. We have the ugly side of our personality, and that's what the rat represents to me. And I think the rat is also like a metaphor for autism, too, because Billy doesn't want to admit to himself that he is different from other people, that he's autistic. And so it is everything that he is repressing and denying about his own personality that is that becomes the rat, that is the rat side of who he is. But the rat is also natural, too. It's just there. And he has to find a way to accept it before he feels overwhelmed by it. Richard, you're on the autism spectrum. Yeah. Is it, it's pronounced Asperger's, right? Asperger's syndrome? Yeah, I, I have, I'm on the very high-functioning end of the spectrum, although I've had my less functioning moments so can you and also um al is as well so you you guys have, you, you both have that in common and I'm, i've always been curious to ask al more about it so now i'll get to ask both of you i mean 
how do you, what I always wonder with Asperger's is like, how, how do you know, because both of you guys are very high functioning. I would never be able to tell in either case, but like, how do you figure out that there's a difference in terms of not being, I guess they call it like, um, you're not neurotypical, right? That's how they phrase it. No. So, and they, I also know the, the term mind blind, like it's hard for you or maybe, maybe the varying degrees hard for you to pick up on other people's feelings, but tell me what the experience is like. Well, well, for me, um, I grew up in a different time. I was growing up in the 60s, so at that time there was no um, sort of, um, let's say, um, initiative or no sort of um, thought given to it other than yeah. I was being difficult uh, and not okay. responding. So they had a different response to it, so it gave me a much later start. Um, to it because uh, you know the biggest thing is recognizing other people's feelings and trying to react appropriately and that was the biggest problem especially in the 60s because they thought th they were much more about manners and appearance and so, so of course you don't you don't act or react the way you're supposed to or you do things or say things that are totally out of the blue because right. you, you you start to try to force yourself to be involved in situations at time to try to be more normal let's okay. say uh, that's what the pressure is so and you find yourself doing things that seem stupid or saying totally inappropriate things in the middle of a conversation right. that makes everyone stop and look at you because you you didn't know what else to say. Right. Wait, and so I'm, I'm going to interrupt. Like you figured out this was going on because you kept getting bad feedback from other people. Is that what it was? That eventually you were like, okay, I, you had to admit, like the dam broke, and you had to admit that this is something that you you are dealing with. Yeah, and it just took it took me a long time because what I did was I kind of spent more time and more time to myself. Okay. Um, especially through school, and it wasn't until college age that I started to push myself out, so to speak. I started to try to become involved or find out why I thought everyone disliked me, so to speak, or so it didn't. You know. Right. Richard, is this is it the same sort of trajectory for you in terms of like, okay, you're saying the inappropriate thing and then the feedback is bad and then you have to course correct? Is that kind of how this goes? Absolutely, yeah. Everything Al said is something I can identify with too, although when I got to college, you know, and I had already been diagnosed with it before then when I was four years old. But it, when I got into college, I decided that I don't really have Asperger's. Right. I was misdiagnosed. And so I started a phase of being in denial about it. And my, when my therapist at college told me that I had it, I was like, no, I don't. And I argued with her. <laughs> So that denial of it made things worse for the couple of years that I went through that phase. And eventually when I was able to admit to myself and to other people that, okay, I actually do have Asperger's, this is a real problem, and then things started to turn around for me. So once I was able to accept that this is who I am, this is my nature, that was when I, I started on an upward trajectory. So, instead you, of getting so both worse. you guys, like right now while I'm talking to you, are you both being mindful and exerting about not saying anything insulting? Is that constantly going on? N not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. I don't think I haven't thought of anything insulting to say right now. That's I can I can honestly say. That. Well, <laughs> Al and I are such winning winning personalities. That, yeah, yeah and, and I don't and I don't know I actually, but I don't know that it would be insulting anyway. It's not that you're. That's not the framework. Yeah, right? that's because that's not. I never have an intention. Yeah, and I'm not looking at um, insulting someone or making. Someone, oh, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not so, looking yeah. at attacking anybody. For me personally, it, it's more about you. You, you see people being themselves and being comfortable with each other and developing close relationships with each other, and you want to be a part of it, sort of. So you throw what you think out, and, and then you just start to have to regulate what, <laughs> what you say at certain times. And It's a communication. Yeah. But, but nowadays, I've made a business out of it. I was just going to say, I mean, you're an iconic class, like you're a rancator, so you, you have your hands so firmly on the clutch that you can actually, with intention, say the inappropriate thing and know that it's funny 
because I guess because you, you're so experienced now where and in understanding where the line is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And 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 I think that uh, society today right now un- understands that people under a challenge or people that are in a minority, so to speak, of any sort of category, um, they sort of let you have leeway. Well, oh, that's interesting too. So that's that's. Uh, 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 sort of a blessing that things sort of ventilated in, in that regard. But, and I, uh, yeah, when I said insulting, it was sort of like a shorthand for like, for where like I know a mistake can be made, it can be inappropriate, the line can be stepped over. But I never would have imagined, like, I, like, I, I know it's not like an aggression thing where anybody wants to hurt somebody's feelings, but it is interesting to sort of um, explore and wonder, like, um, before you guys started managing it, how did it look from the inside? Like, what, how would you describe the unawareness of the line? I know it's I know it's like really like an abstract thing. I think it's more just a reaction you get from people. Yeah, it's a it's a learned thing. Oh, so it's a learned thing. Like, like oh, the, I mean, you know, if you know, if you're unaware of it, that it feels like you know you're a mess. <laughs> like you know, things keep getting screwed up for you, and, and it's hard to understand right why, and it's hard to understand you know people until you start to get a better understanding of of them and i think it's you know and it could be humbling too because you know another thing is that you know i have been you know you know and, and it's kind of and it's a complicated thing because when you consistently get negative feedback from the people around you that can have a negative effect on your personality to the point where you do start you know intentionally being bad you know where you started really being negative and it kind of turns you against people right it like radicalized and that can, and i guess that's kind of the plot of thing too is that after this keeps happening for billy and gina is that because they're suffering so much from their conditions and you know that people around them don't really have empathy for them then that kind of hardens them and they become turned against other people. And so it's kind of a vicious circle. So I've I've come to realize that I'm not completely innocent either. And I do have to be consciously aware of other people and not wanting to hurt people. And I, I absolutely have things I've done that I regret. And I think that's part of it too, is that, you know, once you kind of, realize that is that like well yeah you're the victim but you can be the villain too that i think you know that's that helps me you know understand myself better and other people better right and it sounds like in both your cases yeah the desire is there for human connection it seems like that's the key so it's like you want to get there but you realize that the initial road with your initial instincts is bumpy so there's a process of relearning absolutely yeah and i don't know that i'll ever be as well adjusted as people younger people today that have this yeah because uh, because for me i've learned to set up the 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 setting the setting has got to be on my terms okay so so i've learned that going i don't attend certain events or certain things because of who i am okay i have to have control over the setting yeah and that way i can be more uh, more open, if that makes sense. Right, right. Well, for example, you avoid Jews. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, just I just don't want to step on their tails. Right. <laughs> um, no, wait. So, what's an example? What, what what's an example of a setting that you avoid? Well, like, see, radio's perfect. Whereas television, I hate. But you, know, you do it. You force show. yourself to do it. I know it's very stressful I, for you. Because because that's what that's it. I force myself because each yeah. time I do that, I become better at handling people because if you know most of the times and the very first television shows or things that i've done i i was probably an absolute awful person to work with because they um my actions and reactions were probably hard for them to take and okay. so it's become better now it's, it's i'm much better at it but i still have to keep myself away from uh, certain situations because I know that I won't handle it very well, and and I'm not trying to um, to get better at certain things. Right, I, I, mean, I can, certain, I can only take so much. Yeah, and yeah. plus I'm you know I'm 60 now, so I can only do 
so much in my life, and I have to focus on what I'm doing. So, um, but I put myself in settings, and I that's why I select you know certain co-hosts, certain people around me. I select to be around me because I sort of trust their their nature. Oh, that's more than more than just their talent, because there's a lot of talented people. But you know, how do you select someone? It's because of their behavior, their nature, who they are, and and then you get when you get enough of them around you, you start to function within that wall pretty mm-hmm. good. Yeah, Al's gonna inform me next week that I'm fired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's all, and I, I don't want to stay, stay on the topic too much. But my last question with Aspergers is. Um, it's all interpersonal. When you talk about going into these settings and having these uh, landmines, it's all interpersonal, right? It's like the, the liability and risk yeah. is all somebody getting agitated or, or a message being mixed and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And it can totally wreck you. For, for me, it'll totally wreck me if I, if I make a mistake and it's really noticeable and I really, really understand it now. Yeah. So sometimes it could really wreck my, um, um, what do you call? Um, Homeostasis. Yeah, and yeah. so the way I way I perform then becomes very not very good. Um, oh right, right, because then you feel, you feel do you feel like ashamed? Like you feel like ah oh, man, sort of thing. I'm not sure. I'm not okay. sure if that's the word, but I okay. certainly don't feel like I, I shut down. Okay, got it. What about you, Richard? And I have a another question about directing films, but go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I mean it. You know, it really does not feel good when you make mistakes, and the problem is that. You know, it's hard to apologize for something without sounding insincere because when a lot of people say sorry, they don't really mean it. But I do gen- genuinely regret, you know, hurting people's feelings yeah. by mistake because it really is a mistake, you know. And I realize in retrospect, oh, oh sh- my. now I realize why that was bad. You have to sort but, of put the pieces you know, It's hard to come back from that. Yeah. And I, well, I was curious also because directing a movie and bringing it back to Fang is leadership. So that that's a whole other burden. Like Al's talking about being on camera and all the interpersonal stress being with a the crew. Then Richard, I was thinking about you with like you're at the head of that crew. And then that's a whole other. I mean, I don't have Asperger's, but when I direct a film, I'm completely stressed out almost the entire time. So like, the, and because of the interpersonal things, because I feel like you're constantly being judged you're answering a thousand questions every day and it's just exhausting so i'm just curious your comments and it doesn't have to be asperger's related if you want to get off the topic but uh just your comments on being a leader well it is uh, well i'll say this being you know in that position is hard but it's not the hardest position i've been in because you know when i'm making you know a movie like thing you know this is you know my zone basically you know this is a movie idea that i came up with so it's more like on my terms and you know like with thing you know there's more respect you know for me and what i came up with because i wrote the script and i'm directing it and you know i'm you know so i have this position and even though you know I have plenty of I've had plenty of conflicts before on set, you know I can I can work to resolve it. That you know I'm willing to compromise with people, but I think it's just easier actually when you have that position where it's like kind of built in, kind of respect and status with other people because then you're not just randomly there. What was much harder for me then directing Fang was, you know, just being at school. And, you know, my college years were, like, really stressful and depressing for me because I had a hard time, you know, expressing any of my positive traits. But my negative traits were on display for a lot of people to see. And so now at least I'm able you know, to show people what I'm capable of in a good way. And the bad things about me can be mitigated. And I have more awareness of who I am now, and I can I can compromise more with people. So, so I think it's definitely gotten easier for me over time. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, that's really positive. So it's, also, you. it's also like, you know, it, it, um, 
presupposes that you desire to keep doing it. Like you, it's a role where you really feel comfortable. That's right. Yeah. So what, 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 was, what was it that drew you? Like, what is it you wanted people to get out of the film? Well, that's, that's something I've thought before. What is the message of Fang? And I guess I don't really have a specific message in mind. I just want people to, to have the experience of watching it and that I guess you can read into it what you want. I, it, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, different feedback from people who've watched Fang and I've heard very different things about it. People have very different ideas of what it all means or what it means to them. So I, I guess what I want is, you know, I want it, I want it to mean something personal to you when you watch it. Yeah, when I was watching it, what really stood out for me, particularly because of its indie nature, usually when I see movies that are in, in their budget ranges in the hundreds of thousands, um, a lot of times when they're well done, like yours is, like yours is really, really well made, uh, usually, usually they're self-serious. Oh, like you know, they they can be pretentious, and that might that might not mean that might still mean they're okay or they work. But I thought it was really interesting how Fang is like openly absurd, and like uh, there were points where I was laughing out loud, which is, and I was like, wow, that's really good that he has that ability to manage the comedic tone, even though you're saying other people might have reacted differently. That was my experience. Um, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but there were definitely moments where I was like, oh, okay, this is just like he's you were really. It seemed like even though aesthetically it's very commanding and the compositions are really strong and the editing and performances are strong, it's also like there's a madcap sort of lunacy to it, which I, I, I found appealing. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I think it's, you know, I guess I guess I don't take myself too seriously in, in general because I think, you know, you know, if you do, if you do let things get to your head too much where you start thinking, you know, I'm this, misunderstood yeah. <laughs> genius nobody understands me and it's like no people do there are a lot of other people who have the same kinds of ideas that you do you know there are like thousands of people who want to make movies i'm not exactly unique and so i guess that's kind of my perspective on it and i do want you know i want people to empathize with the characters, but also question them, too, because definitely, you know, in Fang, Billy is absolutely victimized, you know, by his environment. He is not surrounded by very many supportive people, but he also causes problems himself, too. So I like the idea of having that kind of complexity where it's like, Partially, you know, the problem is things that have been, you know, that are beyond your control and, and things that are just in your environment. And part of the problem is also the way you react to it, too. So I think it's a mixture of both. Yeah, that that really does come across. You capture that well. It's it's good to talk. It's interesting well, to get into it more and also realize that the uh, Asperger's symbolism is there and then all the social dynamics you described that go with it are being depicted there. And something else I wanted to touch on that you told me that was really funny and I thought really fascinating is, didn't you say that this is sort of, to some extent, a riff on or a satire of, like, an after-school special? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Well, like, when I started getting the idea to do Fang, and it's, and it's kind of funny because when I was younger and I was in my denial phase, I was thinking, okay, I'm never going to make a movie about Asperger's because I don't want to be associated with it. And then as I got yeah, older yeah. and I started to get more understanding of myself and I realized, well, you know, this is something I've experienced firsthand, you know, to some degree, this is my story. And so I should make a movie about it. However, what I wanted to do was I did not want to make the typical movie about it because most movies about characters who have a disability or they have some kind of terminal disease, you know, they want it to be very like kind of like inspiring for people. They want to say that these characters are overcoming adversity. They're overcoming these obstacles in their life. And with Fang, I want to say, no, you know, disability is not inspiring. It's just something that is, you know, it's, it's beyond our control. Uh, we don't always have to be, inspiring to other people 
that's kind of one of the things I wanted to get across. And I wanted to kind of parody like the whole inspirational disease genre in Fang. Yeah, that's really good. That puts a big smile on my face because uh, it's interesting because the big thing right now is representation, which is great. And I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. And I don't even say that halfway. Like I, you know, being Jewish, if I see Jewish people represented, I usually respond positively and I really appreciate the effort that went into it. Uh, on the other hand, the inspirational expectation that always goes with it can be annoying. It's like, just because we're, re just because we're oh, representing yeah. doesn't mean it has to be like solemn or like, like that can actually really pour cold water on the experience. So I think to represent your own experience in a way that's insane makes it more fun. Like it's like, or not even more fun, but it, it makes it fun, you know, for starters. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I, I think too, you know, with, representation you know if you're representing you know people from different groups or people from different backgrounds you know you want to show that like the best way to show that we're all human is not to treat right. the characters with kid gloves because absolutely yeah. you could be autistic and be a complete asshole for reasons that have nothing to do with autism and i think you know that's that's the best way to humanize you know, characters with disabilities and diseases is to show that, you know, we're not all perfect, we're not saintly, we're not all overcoming adversity. Yeah, that's we're a great, so that, that in you. and of itself is a fantastic theme. And also the uh, the the, uh, the splitting apart of uh, oh, the uh, quote-unquote ailment or disorder, because I have OCD, and one thing I like to make, like, sort of, like, mess with people's heads with, and I don't do it as much because I've gotten older, but... Uh, you know, people, when they know you have it, they assume every single thing you're saying or doing is an outgrowth of it, which is ridiculous. Like, like they, they completely undermine the fact that you have a hugely vast <laughs> yeah. and complex personality and nature. And sometimes, yes, my OCD is flared up. Or, yes, I'm asking this question because I'm feeling obsessive, of course. But then, you know, a lot of times it's like, no, you're dealing with an idiosyncrasy that does not, does not um, spur the categorization of the disorder and people can paint you complete with, completely with that brush. And it's annoying, and it also goes hand-in-hand hand with them uh, just thinking you're crazy and then just, you know, thinking you, you belong behind a locked door, and that's it. So um, it's good to, to break that and explain that, like, no, humanity is, like, you know, transcends all these categories. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's just, like, one part of, you know, who we are, the way your brain is wired, and, you know, you can put two people yeah. with... Asperger's together, they might have completely different interests. They might not get along at all. Right, so, right. And that, that um, is sometimes the case. Yeah, oh, no, well said. That's a good point. And I, I'm also curious, and this goes for both of you also, bringing it back to that topic, like what the relationship is as communicators and artists to emotion. Because if one thing you guys do have in common, um, you guys happen to have in common is you're both funny. Right, or, or your work expresses humor. So I, I'm curious if there's something to that, or like because again, just like for the, the most of the listeners are not going to have an avenue through the emotional landscape of somebody with Asperger's. Like, so I'm just wondering, like, is emotion a priority when you're expressing yourself, or like how is that built from within your world? Well, if you, if you're talking to me, sure, sure. Um, I, I, I find hum, humor, you know, for me, what it did was it started when I was younger and um, I was starting to try to copy people's reactions to to fit in. And sure. uh, a lot of times, especially girls would turn to me and say, I can never tell if you're serious or if right, you're maybe right. funny. And after a while, I thought, you know, maybe <laughs> I should do this is to be funny. That should be your strength. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. no matter what, people like that. Right. You know what I mean? Right. right. Like, you're, you're, dead you're more approachable. You're more acceptable, you know, if you're kind of someone that they want to be around because you're funny. And so I started working that angle and tried to make everything as fun as possible. Yeah, I mean, what, what's interesting about you, Al, and I've co-hosted with you dozens of times now, and I, I always have no doubt when you're joking, like you're hitting the button with complete control and intention. Like I never feel that you're just – being funny, like you just so happen to be being funny. It always seems like you just dial in very deadpan, like mischievously for like, okay, I'm going to hit the button right now. Am I correct? Yes, yeah. totally. 
As a thing, I've had 60 years mastered. to practice this. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've practiced this a long time. Wow. Okay, what about you, Richard, with emotion? Well, one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, with, with Fang and, you know, with other other stuff that I've written, you know, for the screen is that, you know, people can have, like, intense reactions to it and even more intense reactions than I'm expecting. Like, with Fang, you know, after, you know, I showed it to some people, I had the premiere and I sent the movie to different distributors, you know, to watch for distribution. And, you know, there's one guy, you know, one guy who I'm talking to, on the distribution side, who said that he had to stop watching it 30 minutes in because this is almost too painful for him to watch because it reminds him of his own family. And other people have told me that, too, that, you know, it really hits them hard and it resonates with their own, you know, their own family experiences. And other people watch it and say, you know, this is like a dark comedy. This is... You know, this is very entertaining and and everything like that. So I think it, it definitely, I, I can definitely, I definitely can produce strong reactions in people for better or worse. And that kind of goes along with the whole, like, accidentally upsetting people is that I can accidentally make something more intense that I was planning on, or I can be funny without intending to. Too, although a lot of times I am being intentionally funny too, and sometimes I don't even know if I'm trying to be funny or not. I'm being funny and serious right. at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that the that is, oh, thank uh, you. Tone. You also, um, I don't know if you're at liberty to share it, but privately, you were telling me you had some good news on the distribution front, didn't you? Oh yeah, no, I've been in, I've been in talks with. Several distributors. I got my first contract about a week ago. I'm still working out all the details, but I think I think Fang will be unleashed on the general public sometime this year. So, what sort of uh, distribution are you talking about with them? Is it streaming, cable? What's under discussion? Well, Fang will most likely be going to DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming. I would love to get it in more theaters too. I've submitted it to a number of film festivals as well, and I'm waiting to hear back on the results. And, you know, for anybody else who's listening to this, who's going through this process with their own movie, I mean, it's all subjective. You know, you could make, like, something that is, like, really, you know, brilliant and masterful and better than what I've created, but people will still reject it, you know, because it's just subjective. Everybody has a different idea of what they're looking for. And so I think that's something that you kind of have to accept. You have to find a distributor and a festival, you know, who is looking for something like this, or even if they aren't looking for it, you know, then they watch it and realize, I didn't know this is what I was looking for, and I really like this, and I want to be on the same team as this guy. But, you know, it's all about, you know, finding people, you know, who get what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's a, that's um, 100% right. And uh, um, it really, it's all about, in the end, it comes down to compatibility. It's like what Al was saying Absolutely. about his co-hosts. It's just people he has a feel for and a trust. And it's a, it comes down to the same thing with selecting a film. It's like they might think it's excellent, but it's just not the right year for it. It's not going to fit in their lineup. Like, they have different Absolutely. themes they're pursuing or agendas and things like that. Good luck, I mean, uh, with the festivals. Oh, as thank you, you. Yeah, as you uh, wait for feedback to come in. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, I'm really happy with the way most people have, most people have really responded positively to Fang so far. And, you know, like, I can't ask for much more than that. I just hope that, you know, it's something that people can connect to. And, you know, I hope it's something that sticks with people. And, you know, it's a movie that, you know, means something for people who watch it. I don't know what it means, but I hope it means something. Yeah. Now, it's, it's so um, how do people get a hold of you? Where do they find the movie now or where do they find you or anything you've done before and stuff? What, what's your contacts? Oh, well, right now you can look me up on social media. I'm on Facebook. And I'm also on IMDb, too. But soon I'm going to have, like, a revamped social media presence and website 
because I got to get myself more, you know, like get all the professional stuff set up because I have some interesting years ahead. But, and, you know, I will be very vocal once Fang gets distribution. I will, I will be hawking. How dare you? Out of Fang. I will be like, this is where you buy it. This is where you watch it. Watch Fang now. Yeah. yeah. So was it difficult filming over the um, pandemic part? Well, we filmed Fang right before the pandemic started. It was finished like a month before the pandemic really hit. So we had incredibly lucky timing with that. Yeah. You'll have to do a sequel. <laughs> This time the rat turns into a human. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the rat within never completely goes away. Well, uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you talking about the movie, and, and I hope I hope it does well. Oh, thank you, Ollie. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's always a pleasure talking to people and that. And, uh, you know, what what's next for you? Where do you go from here? Well, Eric and I have talked about working together and I can't say too much about that yet because it's still in the very early stages, but we have very strong, you know, instincts for collaborating together. I think we want a lot of the same things in our movies. And I also have several other projects that I'm working on. I have a new script that, um, that I'm hopefully going to get to film soon it's called Broken Angels, and what it's about is, like, this guy is, like, this very, like, he's, like, the opposite of autistic. He's, like, very charismatic, suave, kind of socially skilled, popular guy, and he's campaigning to be elected senator of Florida, so he has all of these kind of typical cliched politician phrases. You know, he knows how to manipulate people to get what he wants. But he has a double life as this kind of psychopathic sexual predator. And so the other characters start to discover the truth about him. And they have to, and they have to figure out a way to convince people that this guy is really evil, that he is destructive. But it's hard because he's so good at kind of manipulating people to be on his side. Wow. Yeah. How did you get the Santos to go along with <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Very there's a good. lot of people that <laughs> were an inspiration for this story. Yeah. Oh, I actually want to say uh, I read that screenplay, Broken Angels, and I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thank you, Eric. Yeah, and I've been, uh, that was before I saw Fang. I was like, wow, this guy's really good. He's got major chops. And it's always a pleasure when that happens, because uh, it's oh, not the norm. You. Yeah, and I think, uh, Richard, you have uh, extraordinary extraordinary days ahead as a filmmaker, and I couldn't be more excited about the stuff you're referring to that we'll be collaborating on. Yeah, thank you, Eric, and I'll, I would say the same for you, too. You have extraordinary days ahead for getting your work out there to more and more people. I am definitely... Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm definitely a fan of your writing and i think it kind of it dovetails nicely with a lot of the stuff that i'm interested in as a filmmaker and we have different styles but i think they go together well well what kind of what kind of movie are you going to make is it like a pornography right. <laughs> possibly <laughs> yeah yeah so you yeah, know it's funny there's elements there's potential elements of that theme in there yeah <laughs> Jeez, how did i know that yeah um well this has been great again um, you know, we've been talking to uh, Richard Bergen, and he's uh, the director and writer and behind the movie Fang. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And, you know, I would, I would like to thank everybody I worked with on Fang. You know, I couldn't do it without my producer, Rob, or my cinematographer, Jason, or any of the actors. You know, all of the actors in Fang did a wonderful job playing their characters so i would like to thank everybody you know who worked with me on fang you know i couldn't have done it alone you've been listening to the house of mystery radio show to find out more about our guests hosts or shows go to www.houseofmystery.com show's over for now was it as good for you as it was for me yeah
Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.